workshop and the session about the achievement of the XDC project. And also let me thank the organizers of this event for hosting us and hosting this one hour and a half, in which we will try to, to present some of the achievement of the project. The chair of the session uh, <clears throat> will be Jacinto Donguito, that probably you already know, and uh, he is also the technical coordinator the extreme, of the Extreme Data Cloud project. So I would like to leave the floor to Jacinto for a short introduction about uh, the session and the presentation of the session and of the speakers, and then I will be back to briefly introduce the the Extreme Data Cloud project. So Jacinto, if you want to say something. Yeah, good afternoon to everybody. This is Jacinto speaking. Uh, uh, again, welcome all to uh, this XTC uh, session. Um, this session will be mainly focus on uh, uh, let you test uh, which services and the components uh, we uh, deeply worked on uh, during uh, the lifetime of the project. The project ended the uh, uh, at the end of, uh, of April. And uh, we developed the uh, uh, extreme uh, data cloud solutions for uh, different communities. And we will try to show the outcome of this, um, uh, of this project during uh, those demos you will see. And uh, we will also try to uh, provide a bit more technical details on how uh, those services works, uh, thanks to the presentation you will see. Uh, we hopefully uh, are willing to make a, I mean, interactive session. Also, if by remote could be a bit difficult, but please just raise your hand to make questions or use the chat to uh, to try to ask uh, things. And uh, I will try to pass the questions or give the uh, right to speak so the people are willing. Uh, to uh, to step in and to make questions. So feel free to uh, ask whatever could be useful for your use cases, your environment, your organization. This is trying to um, understand also from you uh, the feedback uh, that could uh, somehow uh, let us understand how this fits your requirement as user community or service provider. So please. Uh, try to be interactive. Uh, during uh, the um, uh, this session, I, I will send a few times the in the chat uh, window the link for the Slido where you can uh, uh, try to interact with us with the, the question we already prepared to you. And uh, this obviously will help us to uh, get more um, in, con in contact with the, with your feedback. Uh, so, uh, just to go very quickly, I will pass the floor to uh, Daniele, uh, that, is, uh, that will present uh, the, the project as a whole. So, Daniele? Yes, thank you, Giacinto. Let me share my presentation, which is also <coughs> uploaded into the agenda. Just a second. <clears throat> okay, I think you are seeing my slides. A very brief introduction about the project, just to give a little background to the next presentation. I promise I will speak, <clears throat> sorry, for about 10 minutes, not more. So <clears throat> XDC is a software development and integration project and the focus is on uh, policy of service and policy driven data management. The approach was to use already existing quality, production quality data management services. You can see the logos of those services in this uh, slide. And what we did in XDC was to add the missing functionalities to this uh, uh, service toolbox. Okay, functionality requested by the research communities represented into the project uh, uh, consortium. 
XDC is an Indigo Data Cloud follow-up project. So we inherited uh, many technologies that were already developed in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that project. And also we, <clears throat> we use the technologies provided by partners of the, of the project. Our approach is that to release in our internal uh, software repository, but of course we want and we will upload, uh, <clears throat> push back the, our, our uh, developments into the upstream repositories. Okay, so this is done in order to guarantee uh, sustainability of the project uh, after the end of the project. And in fact, the project uh, as Jacinto already anticipated, is already ended. It ended uh, last month, okay, so at the end of April. Okay, five uh, user community have driven uh, the developments of XDC, the CTA, the European XFEL, WSCG, LifeWatch, a CREN for what concerns the medical research. And also we kept an eye on the long tail of science, trying to provide easy to use web, interface, web interfaces to some of our developed uh, services. For instance, the orchestrator dashboard and all the web interfaces provided by the One Data uh, system. As I said, the focus is on the policy driven data management, so orchestration the data management to orchestrate the data life cycle into the distributed infrastructure. Preprocessing during ingestion is another topic that has been addressed by the project. And metadata management. We have a lot of requirements concerning the metadata management, at least by provided by three of the five user community represented into the consortium, uh, CTA, CREN, and LifeWatch. All of them provided uh, requirements for the metadata management. Then data management based on storage events. I will say something more about this later on. Then smart caching and sensitive data handling. Okay, I leave this for a reference, uh, just to say again that the project just uh, uh, just ended. It was a small project, uh, only eight partners from seven countries, uh, three million euros, the total budget that we received from the European Commission under the Infra 21 uh, call of the H2020 framework program. The main achievement of the project is contained into two project releases. The first one, XDC1, codenamed uh, Pulsar, was released uh, last year, and uh, XDC2, codenamed Quasar, was released uh, in, uh, in March. A lot of technical uh, highlights for uh, both releases uh, are present. You can uh, check uh, on your own the release notes uh, for both of them. Uh, ten components for each release were uh, as I said, we used our internal repositories, but all the developments will be pushed back to the upstream repositories. So if you are already using XDC developed services, you will get our developments as soon as they will be, they will reach the upstream repositories. So it's just a matter of waiting uh, some, some weeks. Okay, I would like to stick just on a few topics and technical highlights uh, that uh, are addressed by both of these uh, releases. Uh, first of all, the new generation user authentication systems that was added to almost all the XDC components. I have stolen this slide from my colleague Andrea Cecanti that presented this at uh, the CHEP conference uh, a couple of years ago and the pitch the transition from the older system based 
OMX509 certificates uh, toward a more modern system based on OpenID Connect uh, token authentication system. And uh, this was implemented uh, in uh, almost all the components in our architecture, also respecting all the workflow chain for all the components involved uh, into, the, into the orchestrator change. And the implementation is based uh, on the Indigo IAM uh, solution. Okay, as, uh, as I said, the orchestration workflow for the data life cycle is one of the main topic for the project. And uh, we worked uh, with a twofold approach. Okay, what we call the approach from the top, where the user interacts directly with the orchestrator components. So the Indigo orchestrators and the Rusio in our uh, case, so the, the users can inject uh, data management policies into these components, uh, creating the Tosca templates injected into the orchestrator and the orchestrator is attached to Rusio that enforce the uh, actual policies. But also <coughs> the, the second approach was from the bottom. So the users interact directly with the storage systems and the storage systems are able to raise a storage event notification. These event notification are injected uh, into a message bus, reach the orchestrating components, the orchestrator and Rucho, that apply the policies that had to be previously uploaded by the, uh, by the users. A reference implementation was done for this into the, the cache storage system and also into one day. And let me add here that the Indigo orchestrator is an Indigo PAS orchestrator. Okay, so an Indigo is, an, is a component that is able also to orchestrate uh, computing resources. So it's the link between the computing orchestration and the data management in our architecture. Okay, so it's able to perform what I called at the beginning uh, a pre-processing during ingestion, thanks to a data aware scheduling that is able to, uh, to perform. A few words about the XDC caching solutions. Uh, we worked uh, again in two, two streamlines, one based on the X2D protocol, exploiting the X cache system from the X2D developers. And the other streamline I used, it was based on the HTTP protocol. Okay, in this case, uh, we exploited the Nginx caching system that was extended to support uh, both X509 and OpenID Connect tokens authentication systems. Okay, and the use case for this uh, was the creation of federated uh, distributed uh, caches, for instance, uh, at the national uh, level, and also for the inclusion of this class site into a distributed infrastructure. Okay, for instance, uh, a, a site created on a public cloud, uh, cloud provider. Okay, what we delivered in this case are mainly recipes to deploy the caches. Okay, well, and the distributed the caches. So we did a few development on this, mainly on the X, uh, Nginx plugins, but what we release are our recipes uh, based on uh, Kubernetes and, uh, and containers to deploy, to deploy the caches. We worked a lot on one data, which is a key component for our uh, project. The first part of the project was devoted to improve performance, usability, and scalability of the system. And then many, many functionalities will be, uh, will be added. Lucas will, uh, will present some of these new functionalities later on today. They, uh, they implemented the QoS-based mechanism for automatic data, automatic data placement. Uh, 
the introduction, introduction of harvesters for the large scale data harvesting, the introduction uh, of an elastic search engine to deliver metadata changes, changes that was exploited to support the Ukraine use case. And uh, our colleague Sergei will show uh, the metadata repository that was created for the Ukraine community. So a lot of work done inside one data for uh, supporting uh, uh, metadata handling. Last slide about QoS transition. Again, and in particular, the QoS transition systems that were introduced into the EOS storage system. The storage system used at CERN, but not only. CERN is the main development developer for for this system, we added a new QS management interface based on the CDMI protocol inherited by the Indigo Data Cloud project. And below this CDMI interface, the ELSA team added the support for bulk QS changes. Okay, one limitation of the CDMI protocol is that the transition can be done file by file, one file at once one file at a time. And the, the big work here was done in order to support bulk QoS uh, transition. So a transition engine was developed and included into the uh, EOS uh, system. So I do not have a, a conclusion uh, slide, but I think that more or less I managed to stay on time. I just leave you with the contact uh, details for the project. Uh, and in our website, you can download the Extreme Data Cloud Service Catalog, which is providing more details on the development that have been done within XDC on these already existing, uh, very well-known production quality. Uh, components uh, widely used uh, in the current uh, European, but not only European infrastructure. So that, that's all from uh, from my side. And uh, thank you for listening. I stop sharing. I don't know if you already have questions, or otherwise I leave the floor to Jacinto to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Daniele. I guess that there are no questions, or at least no uh, end was raised or question by, by chat. So uh, let's uh, go to the first uh, demo uh, into the round. Uh, this is uh, mostly an offline demo. Uh, Marika will present us the integration work done in order to put together the past uh, orchestration from Indigo and the Rucho data orchestration from uh, CERN and the LHC experiment uh, working together at the moment. So this was one of the last achievements done into the XTC project. Uh, Marika, I guess you are ready to share the slides, so I'll give you the floor. Well, I think that uh, I already sharing. I hope <laughs> I'm uh, sharing because... Uh, uh, yes, only uh, we see the small window with the slide and all other window uh, is shared too. So maybe just increase the size of... Uh, yeah, that's perfect. It's okay. Okay, all right. okay. <laughs> thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to present a few slides about uh, the uh, policy-driven data management. Um, through the integration of the PAS uh, orchestrator with, uh, with Rusio. Uh, I will uh, go through this uh, um, outline. So I will, uh, first of all, uh, um, recap a brief uh, the uh, pass orchestration uh, architecture and the main functionalities. And then I will uh, present uh, the integration with, uh, with Rusio. Uh, and uh, I will focus on uh, the uh, pre-processing at uh, data ingestion uh, scenario. So uh, the uh, pass orchestrator is based on uh, the developments carry carried out during uh, the European uh, Horizon 2020 Indigo Data Cloud project that started in 2015 and ended in 2017. 
where the advanced uh, features and the important uh, announcements uh, have been implemented in the framework of the project Deep Hybrid Data Cloud, especially for the part that concerns uh, the exploitation of special hardware resources for uh, deep learning uh, workloads. Um, and extreme, extreme data cloud project uh, for what concerns uh, the data orchestration functionalities. And these two projects uh, have just uh, reached the end, but further improvements are still being added uh, in the framework of the EOSCAB project uh, that is uh, still uh, running. Um, in particular, I will talk about, uh, about some of the developments carry, carried out in the XDC project. The orchestration system allows to coordinate uh, the provisioning of complex virtualized compute and storage resources on different uh, cloud management frameworks, both private clouds such as OpenStack, OpenNebula, and public providers such as Amazon, uh, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, and so on. Moreover, the orchestrator is able to coordinate the deployment of dockerized long-running services and batch-like jobs on top of Mesos clusters. And recently, uh, it has been also extended in order to deal with the integration of HPC sites. The pass orchestration system implements an abstraction layer uh, featuring uh, advanced federation and scheduling uh, capabilities uh, that ensure the transparent access uh, to these uh, heterogeneous uh, YAS environments uh, and the selection of the best resource providers uh, based on the user requirements uh, that are expressed in uh, Tosca language and other criteria like uh, the user's uh, service level agreements uh, uh, the services availability, so monitoring data, monitoring metrics, and the data location. This slide uh, shows the high-level architecture of the PASS orchestrator, that is uh, the core component of the Indigo PASS layer. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the architecture is modular and consists of different plugins uh, for managing the interactions and the, the integration with different compute and storage services. Uh, the orange circle is used to uh, highlight uh, the uh, announcements implemented in the XVC project. In particular, we have extended the data placement connectors that are used for the data aware scheduling. It has, the orchestrator is able to submit the processing job to one of the compute centers that have the data specified by the user, so enabling uh, the um, processing near, near the data. And uh, um, we have uh, completely uh, developed from scratch uh, the data management connector that is used to steer the data management system implemented by, uh, by Rusio. Uh, next slide, I will... Um, talk about uh, Rusio, uh, just a few, a few words to say that, to say that uh, Rusio is the, the data management system initially developed by CERN for the Atlas experiment. Uh, it is able to manage large amounts of data on heterogeneous storage systems geographically distributed. Uh, it implements uh, uh, declarative data management. Uh, so the user says uh, what he wants, and Rusio uh, figures out uh, how to do it. Uh, for example, I can say to Rusio that I want uh, three copies of my data on three different sites and one copy on tape. And Rusio will be able to orchestrate uh, the uh, data movement and the, re the replica of the data. So we have uh, integrated uh, uh, Rusio with the orchestrator in order to um, extend the orchestrator cap capabilities. Uh, the orchestrator is basically, uh, was uh, initially a, 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 an orchestrator of uh, compute services, and we integrated uh, the orchestrator with Rusio in order to, um, uh, to, to extend its functionalities uh, also in terms of data orchestration. And in this diagram, uh, I've depicted, I've sketched 
the main uh, workflow for uh, the scenario pre-processing at data ingestion. So the user uh, submits his uh, workflow request uh, in uh, a Tosca template, uh, including uh, some uh, important information like uh, the storage space uh, to watch for incoming data, uh, the application uh, to be run uh, on this uh, incoming data, and the replication rule uh, that must be enforced on, on the incoming or the preprocessed data that will be um, taken in charge by, by, by Rusio. Uh, the storage system holding uh, the watched storage uh, notifies the presence of new data by sending a message to the uh, XDC message queue. This is a new component that has been uh, added, included uh, in uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, system architecture. The Indigo orchestrator uh, listens on this message bus and receives uh, the notification from the storage services. Um, and the, the data, the ingested data are uh, uh, registered into, into Rusio, including uh, the, the replica policy, the replica rule specified by, by the user. Then the orchestrator selects uh, the best uh, compute site to perform the requested processing. And uh, to do so, uh, it uh, collects information from uh, different uh, sources uh, concerning uh, the uh, service level uh, uh, agreements uh, signed by the users with uh, the different sites, uh, the monitoring metrics, uh, uh, the storage endpoints, and so on. At this point, uh, the orchestrator uh, triggers a uh, data movement through Rusio in order to copy the data to the selected compute center. And uh, then the orchestrator gets notified on the completion of the data transfer uh, always listening on the Rusio message queue. Um, finally, the orchestrator uh, triggers uh, the processing job by submitting uh, the request to uh, those computing clusters uh, available at, uh, at the sites. Uh, and in, uh, in our case, it's uh, a Mesos cluster with a Kronos framework that is able to manage uh, dockerized uh, batch-like jobs. Uh, then, as soon as the uh, job output is produced, uh, its availability is notified again to the interested parties, in particular Rusio, via the XDC message bus. Um, and finally, uh, the data generated by the processing step is automatically registered in, into Rusio. And then, uh, after that, Rusio uh, can take care uh, that the policies requested by the, uh, by the user are uh, actually applied. So for uh, completeness sake, uh, here uh, I've uh, uh, put uh, this uh, diagram to show the system high level architecture. At the bottom, you can see the different storage systems uh, that send a notification to the message bus when uh, a new storage event uh, happens, for example, when, when some new data uh, are available. The same message bus is used by the orchestrator and Rusio. The orchestrator is able to consume the messages produced by the storage services and, uh, and by, by, by Rusio itself. Uh, the replication rules uh, are submitted to, to Rusio by the orchestrator on, on behalf of the user. Under the hood, uh, Rusio orchest orchestrates uh, the data movement through uh, the FTS, uh, an FTS plugin. And uh, well, finally, it, it, I, I would like to, uh, to underline that uh, the whole stack um, uses uh, OAuth uh, uh, to zero tokens uh, issued by Indigo YAM uh, in order to, um, to manage the authentication and the authorization uh, through the different uh, uh, flows uh, among the different services. Sorry. Okay, um, this is, I have done, this is my 
uh, my presentation. Uh, and of course, if there are any questions, I will be happy to, to answer. Okay, thank you, Marika. I don't see question either on the slide or either in the chat. Is there any question specifically to this demo? I guess no. So we can move to the next one in the uh, agenda that is uh, from the ECRIN, uh, Sergei will present uh, the work done together with one data team in order to uh, provide the solutions for the medical communities uh, that are supported by ECRI in terms of providing metadata information about the publication. Uh, Sergey, are you yep. ready for sharing? Yeah. Okay, you. Uh, I screen. see your screen. Okay, and the slides are okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome again to the Action Data Cloud Workshop. And today I'm happy to present metadata repository for clinical study objects for ECRIN and not, for, not only for ECRIN, but for the whole medical communities. And I would like to start from the problems which uh, different clinical trial scientists may face and why did we decide to develop metadata repository in general. So first, here we select four different problems. And first main problem here is that uh, clinical research studies and data objects belonging to it are often scared around. So usually the information about clinical trials may, start, may be stored into different websites, publications, repositories, registries, and databases. And it creates uh, huge problems for the scientists to find the necessary information through all these uh, uh, vary of the data sources. Uh, the next huge problem is that the mechanism of gaining access vary between different places and different data objects. Uh, so for some data sources, uh, they may provide uh, APIs which simplify the data access, but some of them don't provide anything and uh, that creates a huge problem because the scientists and the uh, researchers need to scrap the web pages to extract the necessary metadata information. There is no agreed discovery metadata schemas implemented and used for the discovery. It's another huge problem because while the information and the metadata is extracted uh, to be analyzed, it, sh it should be standardized. But the problem here is that each data source uh, store and provide uh, the data in different uh, formats and schemas. And that's and those three problems uh, may be summarized into the one huge problem that the findability of clinical studies and related data objects is a difficult and time consuming process. And uh, here also I would like to make a simple and a small comment about the studies and data objects. What is the study and the data object itself? So the study here is that uh, is the main core information about the clinical trials which include the title, author's main dates of the clinical trials, uh, study type, study status, and all the core information of the clinical trials. And the data objects are the files and the kind of extension for this uh, core information. And maybe represented the documents, the web pages, the XML files, uh, spreadsheets, and so on. So it's uh, the data objects, I could say that they fulfill the information about the uh, clinical trials. So, as you may understand from the previous slide, we decided to maximize the discoverability of all the clinical trials and related data objects and uh, put all the metadata about this into the single system uh, called metadata repository and provide the links uh, to different data sources where the information about the clinical studies and uh, data objects are available. And uh, by the developing of the metadata repository, we decided to support the F or findability principle of all the FAIR principles. So we developed uh, the metadata repository within the XDC project, exploring mainly the one data system. Here, we just provided the metadata and uh, we just provide the data here. 
the main functionality of the search engine and the filtering functionality provided by our partners from Italy, INFM, and one data solution implement the metadata collection and transport from the multiple one provider to the central one zone service and provide the metadata management systems. Uh, on this slide, you can see the main architecture of the metadata repository and probably not the architecture, but in general overview of the metadata repository. Uh, on the top level of this schema, you can see that we start from the collection and processing separately and individually each data source. After that, when we uh, finish to process and analyze the original data, we extract this information and put into individual databases. Uh, after that, the ETL processes start. And these ETL processes mainly include such procedures as the standardization and uh, cleaning from the duplication. After that, uh, all these records become available on uh, the core database containing studies and data objects. All these uh, studies and data objects are linked between themselves and uh, uh, put into the single system. Later on, we start to convert all these files into the JSON format um, and uh, push all these JSON files to the one data system first of all to the one provider, and after that to data spaces, and uh, for sure into one zone later on. And the, as the final step of this uh, whole system is that all these uh, files and metadata information become available through the web portal. Uh, just a few words about the data sources. For now, mainly we work with the four data sources, including clinicaltrials.gov, PubMed, Bilink, and Yoda. Uh, as you can see on the second column on, of this table, um, each data source provides a different extraction method, which I mentioned as a huge problem for the scientists. For example, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, we provide the XML files, which we have to process manually, and PubMed provide the API or XML files as well. And for example, BioLink and Yoda, they don't provide any API or XML files, so we have to scrap the content from the web pages. And the total number of uh, the JSON files uh, is about 800,000 of the JSON files, and this is the status at the end of the March 2020. For now, the total number of JSON files is more than 1 million, and include uh, several new data sources. Uh, now it's time for the demonstration. And uh, first of all, to go to the metadata repository, you have to print into, in your browser this address, crmdr.org. After that, you will be redirected to the metadata repository. And uh, on this page, you can see the, uh, this is, the metadata repository in general, the single web page application. Uh, on the top of this page, you can see the title uh, of the metadata repository, the uh, selection or let's say search uh, fields uh, of the studies. Left panel include the filters for studies and data objects. And on the bottom part of the page, uh, the, you can find the uh, data sources and, and contribution organization information, the disclaimer information, all the context details, and also we include the uh, help information which uh, describe all the mechanisms and uh, procedures of the searching here. So, now I'd like to demonstrate the functionality of the web portal. And uh, here I'd like to start from the selection of this specific study. So by default, you can, you can use the different select modes um, and you can use different modes to find the specific study. So for example, here, if you select the specific study, after that you 
you will see the availability of different uh, study ID types. So for example, you can find the study by the trial registry ID, by the founder's ID, sponsor's ID, and so on. So if I will print here the study ID, which is quite unique uh, for each clinical trials, and then I will click find, I will see that uh, the system found the necessary uh, clinical trials. After that, I can clear the results and go to the next uh, way for all the findability. So for example, I can print here that the data will contain the COVID-19, which is quite important for now. I click on find and the uh, system found more than 1,000 records. So it found 100 to 1,025 studies. And uh, on the main page of the web portal, the only 1,000 of the records is uploaded. So you can click on each study and see the information about each study with the necessary information about the data objects here, with the links and references to external sources. And the green light here uh, means that uh, this uh, data object and this link is publicly available, so you can go to this link and find the necessary information. Also, if I will use the filter section, I can, for example, deselect all and we'll see, will not see anything or select uh, the, all, only the necessary types of uh, the studies and uh, see the results right after the selection or the selection of the options. So, now I'll put the results again and try to make uh, another search and we'll try to find the specific the cardiovascular um, clinical trial which calls OmniHeart. So I found two clinical trials related to the OmniHeart study. Uh, as you can see, each clinical trial here contain the necessary data objects with the useful links. And uh, by clicking on which, you will be redirected to the necessary page with the information or with the document. So for example, you can see that there are several journal articles here. And here contain just the trial registry entry and the journal article as well. And I can click on this link. And yeah, after that, I was re redirected um, to the PubMed source with the information uh, and data object related to the OmniHeart clinical trial. So I'll go back to the presentation. And when the MedData repository was developed and run as a demonstration, so we decided to make the evaluation of the usability and user certifications. So first of all, we developed several questionnaires and the protocols to ask people, uh, especially from the scientific, medical scientific communities, uh, did they find the MedData repository really useful? And uh, their reports were published on 7th of April and the main answers that was yes. So they really happy to use the MedData repository. They found it really useful, user-friendly, and they confirmed that they found all the necessary information in the MedData repository. Um, also, we don't want to stop on this and we would like to continue the development and improvement of the MedData repository. And here we spread out our activity into two main projects, in the EOS Hub project and EOS Clive. But the activities which we will do within those two projects are very different. So within EOS Hub project, we will revise the web portal, upgrade the metadata injection processes, develop elastic search based APIs, extend the metadata repository functionality and collect the data on user actions and the feedbacks. And main focus on in the EOS Clive project will be on the revision of the metadata model, uh, extension of uh, uh, the list of the data sources, 
preparation of the API supporting data access and integration with the other work packages in EOS Clive, like uh, AI work package. Uh, also, which is very useful for now, is that the metadata repository helps with the COVID-19 crisis. We put metadata repository in production for a green task force on COVID-19, uh, which is accessible on the web page here. Uh, also, metadata repository has been linked as a related resource to the European COVID-19 data portal. Metadata repository included the recommendation of the RD COVID-19 guide guidelines and recommendations, which is under development and will be available on this link. And also, metadata repository has been proposed for inclusion in the infection disease data observatory. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Sergei. Uh, there is a question from uh, Tony. Hi, Tony. Uh, a very interesting one indeed. Um, which is the role uh, of one data in this uh, particular topic, in this particular uh, use cases? Uh, maybe since we have also Lukash connected, that uh, is uh, somehow like so. to, to have a demonstration soon after, it could also uh, try to go much deeper on the one data um, functions in this uh, usage for this use cases. Uh, yeah, so I can answer this so that uh, one data here for the metadata repository, the key component, as Daniel mentioned before, uh, the one data in general, the key component for the whole uh, extreme data cloud uh, activities, but for Ecrin especially, we use the one data system to store uh, our metadata in JSON format. Uh, and uh, after that, the, the portal, which I demonstrate here, is created within the uh, one data uh, system. So yeah, metadata repository the portal is publicly available, but it's uh, created within the one data system and it is kind of the plugin of the one data. It's kind of extension of the one data system. I will give a short, uh, short, very short demo about what's going on behind the scenes about this project. I mean, about this demo, about the MDR things later on. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, wait for the demo uh, soon after. There will be a bit more information. There is also uh, another question from uh, Giro. I hope the I pronounced correctly the name. Um, uh, the the question is: uh, You say you need uh, to escape uh, Yoda. When you are able to use high rods for this? Uh, as far as I know, we discovered the Yoda uh, data source, and we found the only way, the only optimal way to extract the data by the scraping, because uh, there there was also a possibility to uh, download records from the Yoda in CSV format but the information which is included into this uh, CSV file is quite limited. And if we scrap the web pages, we, ex we can extract the more information, including the links to the necessary data objects, which are represented to the documents and the files. Thank you. Uh, is there any further comment or question? I guess no. I don't see any other uh, feedback from neither from uh, Slido or uh, I end. Sorry, please. One more okay. comment. Yeah, please. So also, we have the Acron Metadata Repository Wiki uh, website where you can find all the necessary information about the Metadata Repository, uh, including the Metadata standards we are using for our Metadata schemas, the JSON schemas examples with the detailed description and the information about the data sources, individual data sources and the control terminology. That's all. Okay, thank you. 
So, guessing there are no further questions to Sergey, I will uh, leave the floor to Lukas. I guess that most of you already know Lukas from uh, One Data Team. Uh, he will uh, try to highlight the most uh, interesting uh, topics that developed within XTC from the One Data tool, and uh, we will also see a very nice demo from Lukas. So, um, Lukas, I already see your slide shared, so I guess you're ready. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. So, good afternoon. Uh, this is Lukas speaking. Um, I will give you a very short uh, evaluation and the current uh, summary of the current status, uh, how the one data platform looks like after XDC project, uh, which was uh, supporting heavily uh, our work. And uh, just to summarize, what is the one data? And what are the ambitions of our platform? Uh, we wanted, and we are cross cloud, and we are currently a cross cloud data processing platform, which is uh, delivering to, to the end user unified data access processing um, abilities at a large scale, uh, converting converging the access to hybrid 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 resources in terms of different good uh, clouds as well hybrid uh, storage is different types of storage backend technology. And all of these things should be uh, allow easy user to easily access the distributed data and manage them while the processing and deliver the, the data uh, in the uniform way. Although uh, we extend as well our functionality, not only to the data, but as well to the metadata management. So we deliver a consistent data and metadata management platform, which allows us well to build a data discovery uh, infrastructure based on distributed data, feeding the metadata changes into the elastic search. And that, that was the part presentation of CAG presentation just before me, uh, where we were delivering uh, data from several data sources into the uh, the centralized uh, elastic search eventually con in eventually consists in one manner and based on that there is a plug import okay uh, i will give you a, a very short demo of these little slides uh, of a few things which are which has been changed in our platform in the release 2002 which is publicly available now and it will be a four topics so this is the data management just a very short introduction to what we are and uh, for those who doesn't know uh, what that one data platform is and uh, it all as well brings uh, a new features about the craft case interface. As well, I, I will tell up as well about the three different new things, completely new things being supported by, um, um, the development of those things was supported by XDC project. One of them is quality of service. Second is the new advanced token mechanism and data discovery. Okay, so I will switch to the a live demo now and i will show you my screen this is like a, uh, my demo infrastructure uh, demo.1data.org and for those who doesn't know us uh, one very uh, important remark is because i'm, I'm ask, answering this question very often this is the the world you can build by yourself so demo data is just deployment of our component software stacks uh, in my in my my uh, uh, domain authority uh, but it's not like the Dropbox approach where there is uh, one central service needed in the world. It could be completely different, different implementation, different deployments. One of them is EGI Data Hub, and there are others as well, completely different environments. So we don't need to be involved in the, in the ecosystem provided for your community. But okay, coming back to my, my demo, this is the entry page of my demo world and is connected to the several external IDPs, which allows me to, which are tightly integrated with our system authentication. So I can log into the system, for instance, using EGI checking, which is one of the EOSC um, uh, IDP system, and it, it enters and delivers me my world access. So we have a view for the data providers. Uh, it means that at the points that the storages and places where my data are currently managed by the platform itself in the distributed places, uh, distributed world, we have something in Krakow, in Italy and, and Portugal. But uh, my data authority brought me as well some information from, uh, which is, I mean, authentication authority brought me some information 
of who am I and uh, brought me information about the membership on special groups. It was inherited automatically from the uh, from EGI checking. And this is the place where uh, where the old hierarchy is, uh, is there. And we can see the, the, the changes uh, in the place of the my membership, uh, depending on the on my authorization. I have a very limited authentication. I, I cannot see the whole structure of the tree if I'm coming from the EGI, but I can only see my parts and the groups where I'm a member of. And the groups are a, a big hierarchy of the EGI SSO. Uh, as an organization, but uh, this is the, the these are the groups I'm a member of, and each of those groups might have some subgroups, but I don't um, I don't have a special rights in most of those those groups to see the members. It, it depends. Everything is tightly connected with the single sign on. But this is a data management platform, and this is fully distributed and based on P2P principles. So we introduce a concept of the data collection, which is named in our system space, data space. And this brings you the, the idea of the, the different spaces. I have uh, access to a few data spaces which might be shared amongst other users. These data spaces currently are shared only to me, but, but just for demonstration purposes, you can see them. I can just share this particular data space to to all of the all of the data uh, demo one data network users. So if you log into the system, you will be seeing that. Uh, of course, uh, this brings uh, some complication as I can see who actually might see my data space because those those people are already a member of all the users group. If you will be logging the, to the system, this users group will be uh, uh, user base list will be growing. Okay, this is like a first first factor of authentication which brings us a special control. What are the roles of each of the groups member of each of the individual user in our system? So we can uh, define precisely what is my uh, high level role in that collection. Of course, each of the collection might have a different pattern of access control of pay per user, per group membership, which gives me a full freedom of sharing data amongst uh, the groups of the user I'm collaborating with at ad hoc. But the, the principle, the major thing is like in our system is where the particular data collection might be stored. And this is like a P2P approach in our system, gives me the access to the distributed uh, infrastructure, give me an overview of the distributed infrastructure supporting particular data collection. In this case, the data collection is named Demo XDC. And this particular collection is supported in three different locations. I have a different collection which is supported in the, by two, two of the providers, which I have access, of course, this could be completely uh, detached, it could be different, completely different providers, different software stack supporting uh, disjoint collections. This is, doesn't need to be, it's connected at all. It's complete global mesh and no central point of anything except the entry page, which is called one zone. Of course, uh, if you have a data, you want to see the data. And uh, we provided you as well a, a graphical user web browser for the data collection, so some sort of virtual file system. But of course, everything what, I'm, what I would be do is not for the graphical user interface, it's for the REST API and for POSIX virtual file system. So I can mount my virtual file collections. I have access to, to my virtual, to the POSIX and do the processing on this on this collection based on the caching algorithms and so on, transferring things across different locations. But if you're looking at this, uh, this collection now uh, at the Demo XDC, I'm connected to, you are seeing now a new GraphQL interface, which is the result as well of the XDC project, which is probably not, pres I haven't presented it yet uh, at all to anybody. Uh, so this is like a new integrated uh, data navigator. Uh, which brings me to the, the idea about the locality of my data. And now I'm connected to the place, uh, to the Barry. Uh, I can switch between the locations like a taps in my system. This is actually connected to Krakow now, or I'm back now to Barry. But the idea about our system is of course delivering the global namespace. So wherever you go, you technically should see more exactly the same thing with some delay uh, the late compensation because it's based on the eventual consistency. So if I have a, a distributed file system like this, a distributed data collection like this, uh, I can manage the data locality. This is, this is what differentiates our system 
from the others uh, at all because we have inherited uh, the in, 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 in be embodied uh, the locality of data and in this case uh, the data is coming from the existing nfs collection which is like fed to automatically register it into the uh, data uh, into the uh, one data world at bari and I have like a storage, Ceph storage in Krakow and S3 storage at Lisbon. So all of those uh, technology behind the scene are completely hidden from the, from the users. So I can tell the system replicate me here. And it will, in a few seconds, you will see the, the replication uh, is there. If I switch to Krakow, I will see that that's faster because uh, there will be no delay in communication. So it's a matter of milliseconds where the data is replicated, depending on the size. But the delay of the, the first blows is very, very low. So when then, no matter where I access my data, uh, we, you, we will deliver you. If I access the data from Kraku, and I, now I'm connected to Kraku, and I will be, and as you see here, the data is not there. Uh, I can read this, this data, and this will be delivered to me on the fly, which means that there will be a, a delivery and data caching uh, approach. So the data is cached now in Krakow because the replication happens. Of course, this leads to a lot of opportunities because we allow you to define the jobs, then you can uh, replicate the whole directories and so on. But now I'm coming to a new mechanism which we introduced during the uh, XDC project, which is, a, which is a called quality of service. So this mechanism allows me to define the quality of service uh, of a specific file based on the, the rules, which is the, the inherited and, 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 and inspired by Ruscio. So you have a rules which tells you about uh, special tags and operators, logic operators there, uh, which allows me to tell where the actual, I um, expect the number of replicas and what's the rules of re replication. So it means that Everything what I create uh, on a particular, uh, it makes more sense on the uh, individual directory. So I will define it here. I will sell that uh, country equals Italy, uh, uh, which is like the, the current status. Basically, this is the place where the, the files are, are there. So it means that the, the quality of service rules will be, will, be, will be verified very quickly because no replication, no replication is needed because currently the data distribution is Italy. But if I tell the system extra another rule that, the, that as you see here now is green because everything is fine. Now I will tell another rule. So there should be many rules. Uh, country equals Poland. Um, or storage, I could have like a complex uh, complex query here with uh, brackets and other logic operators and uh, summaries, in, uh, intersection and so on there. Uh, I will force that everything what I have in, the, in this directory is uh, properly replicated to, to Krakow. As you see now, the replication happens it's very quickly because the data distribution happens. Everything now is start being replicated behind the scene to, to Krakow because that was my intention. So whatever I create in, in, in my distributed ecosystem, the system tries to fulfill my rules of the quality of service. And this, this gives a lot of freedom in terms of the complexity, data management and distributed system, because you can attach this multiple quality of service expect expectations on the different levels, on the level of the entire collection, on the, or even on the level of the entire, on the single director of the single file. So the most important thing is that we can ask the system at any level, whether, what is the current quality of service rule uh, uh, fulfillment at this very moment? So it's green if everything below is green. We use a very complicated algorithm. So for the very large uh, collections, you can ask a particular subdirectory to check uh, what is the current fulfillment of the rule. And the system will tell you if this particular subdirectory is already fulfilled, even though the whole, uh, the whole quality of service expectation is not fulfilled yet because it takes a lot of time. Of course, this what I did, it, it, it requested uh, some data transfer operations. Uh, as we catch it here, it's like the 
there was like a very small uh, traffic because of the files were behind the scene uh, manner. So this is what you can see and observe the traffic of the quality of service. And the expectations, how do you perceive the, the locality? The second new thing is like what we do, what we did it is we redesigned the, the entire access token mechanisms in in our platform, which we brought a new mechanism to, to build a new access tokens. As you know, you, you use in our system a tokens for authentication delegation. So you can control, you can connect one client, you can connect your virtual file system, uh, then you need to present yourself uh, using a token. It could be internal token from our system or could be external token from external IDP. But our internal tokens gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, demo tokens gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of the precise uh, limitation of this token because these tokens might be very powerful. This is like a total delegation of your uh, identity. So we introduce a, a lot of uh, things like, you know, you can define the region where the token can be used, for instance, Antarctica uh, or the particular country or even ASN from BGP. So if I know that uh, uh, INFN IGP, uh, INFN uh, IPs are the, connected to 137 uh, uh, BGP IS number, this, this is my bet. It's preferred to use just the IP masks for the access. IP masks, of course, are, are possible. But we can specify as well for what purpose the token might be used, which limits the tokens used for one client, which are not allowed to, for instance, use the REST APIs and can't delete or mess up with your account if this, this data is, uh, this token is leaked. But the most interesting tokens are in the data part here, because we can specify what is the what is the power of the token in terms of the data access? So we can tell that this token can be only used for read only to the data. So it block any, any rights I have in my system are overwritten by the token now. And this gives me the only read only access. Plus I can de dedicate some special path uh, to the brain, uh, let's say uh, uh, brain scans uh, or some other, a few other paths. paths demos um, and so on or in, in even individual object id in our system such created token uh, is is very limited and this token is like the uh, limits uh, usage of can be used only within this this criteria this limitation i prepared the previous the token different one for the this limited token to demonstrate you quickly during the demo is a token which is limited only to use from uh, uh, from Italy and Poland, ISN 137, which is uh, INFN, and um, brain scan and demo and read only. And this is my connected. I, this is my connected examples. This is my uh, screen. I will switch to the demo i mounted the virtual file system one that i virtual file system twice one is like my my data with a full token so i can see everything what is in inside of, of my ecosystem this is exactly the same what you have on the graphical user interface or i mounted it with the limited token this is a li called limited space and this is that this this token which limits only me to read only the data and access only the demo and brain scan from the single collection. And now when I enter this, as you see, I can only see single collection instead of all my collections, uh, all my collections, uh, sorry, all my collections before. And when I enter this data collection, I, I'm not even seeing all the directories, uh, all my files. This collection is only limited to this, this prefix of patterns. So when I, when I will go to the demo, I see that the files, but when I want to cut the files, they work fine. But when I want to remove the, the files, it's permission denied because it's read only. So this gives me a lot of uh, extra flexibilities to make the, the, the tokens uh, very more secure in the large scale distributed processing and the very controlled delegation of tokens. Of course, the expiration time as well is important. If I, Define that this token is not very very trustful. I can just take go there and revoke it and save 
and as of now in a few seconds depends on the situation uh, the token will be rejected to use at all uh, so I, I just revoke the token if i find out that the whole thing is, is problematic the next thing i wanted to just to tell is like a final very quick thing and to address the problem which was the question by uh, by tommy uh, to to tell a bit about the data discovery uh, data discovery uh, and integration by with elastic search uh, the thing behind the scene looks like in this picture. Uh, CID was presented only this part, Embedded Discovery Portal, which is a part of our one zone. But this Embedded Discovery Portal was connected to Elasticsearch, but Elasticsearch was fed by the metadata gathered from, by, uh, from the several uh, collections, and the collections are gathered by the data spaces, which are supported by several providers, and uh, the data collections were pumped from the external systems. So we have the distributed data management, which gathers metadata as well. And this, there is a, a thing which we call data harvesters, which uh, at the level of the zone gets eventually data metadata from the external system and feed them to the Elasticsearch to be used for data discovery portals. And uh, the important part of that is like we guarantee that the metadata is not lost and we guarantee as well eventual consistency, even the complexity of the distributed environment and metadata connected to these files is, is quite enormous. So at the large scale. So the, we solve a lot of troubles to make the, the data consistency between the data and metadata management systems and delivering them into the elastic search or multiple elastic searches depending on the configuration so you have your flexibility in the zone to define the different harvesters which are pumping metadata from different data spaces into the different elastic searches so that was the, the that was that, that's what i wanted to conclude my presentation to take over my time and this is the time for the, the questions uh, if you if you are interested in more details. That was a very quick summary of what we did during XDC and how one data looks like at this very moment. Thank you, Lukas. Thank you for this uh, nice uh, live demo. And I don't see a question on the chat. I'm just cross-checking uh, on the Slido. I don't see any specific question to Lukas on Slido. Uh, is there anyone who would li like to add comments or question both to the uh, Lukas uh, demo and uh, the information or to the other presenters? I guess. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, is there a question, I guess, uh, to, to Lukas first, and then uh, we can also answer as a project as a whole. Uh, are uh, quality of service rules based on metadata? Oh, this is a very good, very. This is a very good question. I wasn't very precise uh, in my presentation. Uh, um, the answer is like the quality of service rule uh, rules are based on metadata, but attached to the storages. So if you have a distributed system like us, what we will what we do is a, a bunch of providers. Each of those providers have a different backend storage system. In our system, you can have multiple storage behind each of those dots. And in our system, if you look at the, the configuration cluster, for instance, for Bari, uh, you can see on my screen that there will be a metadata, in one moment I need to connect there, there will be a metadata matrix specifying an, an expressions which might be used in the, in the quality of service rules in the, uh, one data uh, in the storage. So there is a, actually in this uh, particular Bari, we have only one storage, which is uh, a POSIX, is a POSIX which is imported from external file system, as I, as I told you. And there are uh, quality of 
service parameters, which is a storage POS6, it's external true, and it's located in country Italy. Of course, the language of expression can be grown, is a, like a matter of vocabulary defined amongst the, the players using under, under the single uh, environment and ecosystem. So we have like a rules for uh, core ideas for the data the latency, uh, data durability aspects, and so on. So you can tell, express that I want things in Italy on the storage with high durability, or I want to have things in a specific Polish uh, data center with the, on the storage with high throughput, because I will be delivering and processing the data quickly uh, in, a, in the next days. So this is the metadata, true, but not but connected to the storage and ecosystem and configuration. So this is uh, this is the answer to this, and we'll give you uh, flexibility based on the complex rules of expressions that you can express uh, into the system, making the whole thing working as you, you want. And this is inspired, as I told you, inspired by Ruscio work as well. So it's quite similar. In case of, for instance, of uh, Lisbon, we have a few storages there. One of them is storage S3, a location in Portugal, and second as well as three. So basically it's like a, you can have like a complexity of these storages. You have like a providers, providers have multiple storages. And on top of that, these storages are supporting your spaces. And thanks to that, you might use expressions which are complex. Uh, thank you, Lukas. Uh, I would add to what uh, already Lukas said that obviously this is uh, uh, the same behavior, more or less uh, doable with the uh, use of uh, Ruscio, as uh, Lukas was uh, uh, quickly recapping. And uh, this means that uh, both if you have the full one data solutions or if you are uh, exploiting uh, just a few of the services of XDC, you may have similar behavior uh, orchestrating the data based on some specific set of metadata and based the rules on those uh, specific set of metadata. Uh, always on the, on the uh, levels of uh, uh, metadata, uh, there is a question from Marc Portier. Um, I tried to to recap the question, does any components in XTC uh, work towards extracting, adding, publishing, semantic to either data or metadata? More specifically, no elements from uh, WC3C uh, uh, vision on SEMWeb or LOD like or RDF or LDP uh, seen to be the scope of the project are those foreseen in the future version. Lukas, I know there are some uh, things about metadata and RDF format that you can show up. Maybe yes, you can yes. just... Uh, in yeah. our system, uh, because I still think I'm sharing the screen, okay, I do. Uh, in our yeah. system, uh, what you do is not exactly just data, but like this, so you might have a data object and metadata. And we support currently three levels of data. Metadata support key values. So this is a list of key values. JSON, which is like an object uh, object class uh, structured thing, and RDF. RDF is uh, XML uh, things which are uh, connected to the, to the files. So you, you have the files, data or data objects, plus the, the bunch of metadata connected to it. And the metadata gives you some extra features for data discovery, data processing as well, and access and managing this, this, this part of the in the ecosystem. Uh, so what else we do with the metadata, which might be interesting, is we support thing which is called sharing, data sharing. So it's like the, it's a part of the, X, X, this is not a part of the actually XDC project, it was a part of EGI and Gage, but uh, it's connected to all those things. So you might uh, share the collection or part of the collection, which gives you the, uh, the, the public, available directory which might be used and then later on published using a DOI if you have a proper agreement with DOI or a PID system connected to your environment. In my demo I don't but it's like a part in EGI engage should demo data hub is connected there. So you might have like a public environment which is completely available for to the users uh, in the world and then you publish data and metadata as well. Plus, while you're publishing this, uh, while we are meeting this DOI, there is a process of uh, 
publishing the, the information there, including the metadata uh, connected to the collection, which is later on as well exposed using OI PMH interface for data harvesting and data discovery. So you, we deliver you a call ecosystem and bring where you manage your data for processing manage the metadata for data discovery internal or external and as well for publishing the, the data results in form of open data uh, which is uh, as well connected with data and metadata part so this is probably partially answering all the question I'm not 100 we don't 100 percent cover all this aspect yet Yes, just to add uh, a small comment on this. Obviously, there are in the project uh, there is also um, a, a, there are several communities that is uh, managing the metadata space from themselves. So taking out the, the metadata part in a dedicated services from the community expertise. And uh, we are uh, well able to onboard and to use these solutions and uh, let they them just use or leverage the services for the data management uh, and the data access, etc. So it, it will really depends on the uh, needs of your community and, and the way you decide to work on uh, those two aspects together, the data and the metadata. There are also some examples from uh, CTA community that is uh, using one data to leverage the ability of uh, automatically uh, look to new data, look to the metadata and pre-process those data in a way that the metadata are automatically registered into one data solutions uh, by default as the new data appears. So it really, it is flexible enough that at the end really depends on your real requirement from as user community. And we can try to, uh, to fit your uh, perfect solution on uh, on your requirement. I see another there question about, uh, about uh, from Carl Frederick Canal. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to keep registered authorized user up to date, for example, when changing affiliation, etc.? Yeah, this is a very very good question. Uh, this is the integrated, tightly integrated with IDP, so it's like this. So when I'm logging to the system, we gather uh, through the external protocol, attribute protocols from OpenID Connect or some uh, bunch of the external attributes which tells us the, what is the membership, uh, current membership uh, of those users. If I'm kicked out of some of the other groups, the system will automatically me uh, remove from that, that group from our system during the next next uh, token token verification authentication so usually it takes like uh, several minutes of course it's not instant but we will renew this information from the external system and then uh, after the next time you will be not a member of a particular group for instance if you are not uh, access this group anymore and in that sense these groups will disappear from my list i have a gigantic bunch of the groups here uh, because uh, i'm a member of many many groups in egi uh, I do it on purpose, but uh, this is like the, the case of tight integration of our system with the external IDPs. But this is crucial for data management and access control rights because I can use these groups as well for different levels of membership controlling as well access control rights because we have like the permission things here based on uh, access control rights, which allows me to use these groups to the individual user or groups uh, to define the, the very precise uh, NFS version level uh, of a particular file or particular data collection. So this is multi-level. First level, what I can do in the generic uh, data collection, as I showed membership or individual files as well. And this is tightly connected. What I, what I gather from external IDP, it goes through group memberships here, and the groups are then later can be used while uh, individual or individual users can be used for precise data management access control. 
Yeah, if I may add uh, a bit about uh, the authentication authorization part, uh, as um, I mean, platform-wide solution, we use uh, um, Indigo EM for most of the others, for most of the services in the EM, you can easily uh, join different um, uh, IDP entries on the same uh, identity from EM. So you can join your Google account together with your home IDP and this gives you the possibility to, uh, to try to map uh, different uh, uh, IDP logins to the same real authentication ID, and then you can use the same on to several servers and uh, instances uh, as you are looking into this demo. We are using also EM, uh, you know, as uh, EDP for the uh, this one data instance, for example. This is doable for uh, many other services already in the XTC and further. So this will help us also to dig into this uh, very interesting problem indeed. Yeah, so while you're the Jacinto is explaining the integration with EM IDP, I just show you we're logging with different IDP. Uh, and in that different IDP, uh, I have a different identity. And this different identity is member of, of different part of the groups. And these groups have a limited access. And if you see in my screen, now I only see a single data collection. And I'm a member of this data collection, the, mainly because uh, at the moment um, I see this uh, because I'm a member of all users. This is why I see this uh, this group, this uh, data collection. I'm a different Lukas Dudka than the, this, is, this is me. And I, I see that part because uh, I'm a member of the, the other collections. So uh, tech, the other groups, and this is why I, I'm, I'm seeing it and the others are not there. So this is tightly connected uh, to the, the ID, different IDPs. And we support open I, uh, I am as a first uh, citizen. Inherited from Indigo, but as well we are supporting EGI and Gage, uh, EGI uh, check-in, and um, and a few others, uh, including Elixir uh, IDP with the extended attribute system. Ah, okay, uh, sure. Uh, Mario David is asking where the one provider in Lisbon is uh, is hosted. <laughs> Yeah, so this is like private deployment, uh, not, not, unfortunately not at Leap, but uh, I would like to get some resources from Leap for, for making my demos there, so <laughs> it's not there. Okay, so, so next time Mario, next please time provide some, <laughs> some VMs to, to Lucas to, to make it. This, this it is resources from, from, from the other project. Uh, resources from the other project. Can, you, can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, please. Please, Mario. So indeed, I, we have uh, one provider of, at Lisbon, uh, since one and a half months for the CDataNet uh, project, but I was not able to uh, instantiate and there were some errors. This is one thing. And in the past, indeed, we had at, uh, at LIP in the NCD uh, uh, one provider. So it's not uh, like we don't want to have the one provider. Nobody asked uh, beyond that. No, 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 no. no. Uh, if you have any troubles, I will, of course, we will help you. And the demo is for the newest release 2302, which is really fresh. And I'm using the, uh, just control the demo environment just for, for my, ourselves. There's not production data uh, behind uh, any of this, uh, this demo infrastructure. This is just for, just for the distributed purpose, uh, demonstration purposes. But of course, uh, the production, we are welcome to, to help you. Uh, you are welcome to help you uh, in the deployment of these things at LEAP for the production scale. Okay, so thank you all. Um, unfortunately, we reached our uh, time limit. So with this uh, last minutes, I would uh, like to ask you again to fill up our pool on uh, Slido. And uh, please, if you leave us your contact, we will get back to you trying to answer to questions or to any kind of uh, feedback we may provide uh, to you in order to get more uh, 
connected to the XCC project. I, we see already a few uh, questions and, uh, and comments. Uh, it would be very useful for us, but please go on uh, providing uh, as much comment and feedback uh, you can to, to us. We will appreciate. Um, Daniele, if you want to just add something at the end. Uh, yes, I wanted to advertise uh, the poll and survey again, but you already did it. Just let me thank again all the participants to this call and also the organizer of the entire EOS Cup week for hosting us and giving us the possibility to show some of our uh, services and uh, XDC developments. And thank you all again. I think we can close the, the session, Jacinto. This yep, indeed. Yeah. Um, Rob, how it works, we should close uh, the meeting. You should do it. No, it's OK. Um, I'll, I'll be one time, but we can uh, move on to your next uh, sessions now. Meanwhile, I'll push everyone to the waiting room again to prepare for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone.